Hey folks, this is Riker with another Diablo lore video. In today's episode, we discuss the fate of the residents of Tristram, the establishment of the rogue encampment, and Aiden's voyage east. This is part 14 of a video series in which we explore the major players in the story of Diablo, from the Nephilim to Tyrael to Deckard Cain to Diablo himself, and give a crash course on what exactly is going on story-wise in this game series. Feel free to check out our previous episodes if you haven't, and be sure to have subscription notifications turned on so you can catch when a new episode comes out. Because I'd really like to be caught up before Diablo 4 releases, and uh, yeah, that's that's coming up. Eh. April, is it? Now before we move on, just a quick word from this video's sponsor, Established Titles. A fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping with global reforestation efforts. Do you ever think it would be cool to hold the title of Lord or Lady like in Game of Thrones? Well, with established titles, you can officially do so. You buy a personal lordship or ladyship title pack with dedicated land in Scotland. Basically, you're buying a tiny plot of land, at least one square foot. It has a unique plot number, and it's on a private estate in Eddleston, Scotland. And as per ancient Scottish tradition, landowners were referred to as lairds, aka lord or lady. Then you receive your official certificate with a crest, and with every order, established titles plants a tree. Working with global charity partners, one tree planted, and trees for the future. So not only do these make for great novelty gifts for people, or for yourself, you're also helping the environment. And in any place that you can use Mr. or Mrs., you can actually use Lord or Lady now. So on a credit card or on a plane ticket, and the first 200 people who will buy a title pack using my link will effectively have their plot next to my plot, at least within a few minutes walking distance. So depending on how many of you want to go for this, we can build our own little kingdom of Rikers, Raiders, Lords, and Ladies. Now again, I think this makes for an amazing last minute gift. And Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use code Riker, you can get another 10% off. Just go to EstablishedTitles.com slash Riker to get your gifts now and help support the channel. In our last episode, we covered the events leading up to the ending of Diablo 1. The slaying of Diablo by Prince Aiden, who then inserted Diablo's soul stone into his own forehead to contain the evil. Or, at least, try to. Spoilers. Now, last episode, we spoke a bit about Adria the Witch, but we said we'd save her story for a future episode. That episode is now. To recap, Adria had arrived in Tristram while most people were fleeing the village. But her story began long before this about 40 years before this, when she was born in Kingsport, a city in Westmarch. If you've played Diablo 3, you may have heard the scoundrel follower, Linden, prattling off about Kingsport. Adria was born into a powerful merchant family. Her father, Severin, cared more about his business than his own blood. When his fleet of ships was lost in a storm, he lost a small fortune, which led him to get drunk and beat his wife to death. Real stand-up guy. Because of his wealth and influence, he got away with this crime scot-free. Or so it seemed at first. Adria was 10 years old at the time, and shortly after Severin was released from jail, he died in a house fire. As he was horrifically burning to death, he saw his daughter, and the last word he breathed was witch. Witch the noun, not the pronoun. A word that would follow Adria for the rest of her life. Water allegedly was unable to put out the fire, and it took a full day for the fire to go out. After that, Adria vanished, fleeing Kingsport, but somehow being labeled a witch anywhere she went. Still, those same people shunning her for being a witch were the first to come to her for aid when they needed help curing a disease or locating a missing child. You know, because hypocrisy. At some point, Adria managed to hook up with some other witches, a secret coven within Westmarch's remote wilds. Over the years, she rose among their ranks to become a prominent witch. During her time with the Coven, she was tasked with locating the resting place of Bale, Lord of Destruction. Remember, last we left Bale, he was trapped in a soul stone that was stabbed into the chest of Talrasha the Haradric Mage, who had decided to sacrifice himself to contain Bale's essence within his prison. And that was centuries before Adria's birth. Adria did manage to discover that Bale's spirit was contained within Talrasha, and even managed to find the tomb of Talrasha in the deserts of Aranach. But she could not, however, figure out how to enter the final chamber of his tomb. Probably because she didn't read the quest guide to get the Roger Cube, the amulet, and the staff. Now you may wonder, why did the Coven care about Bale? How do they even know about Bale? Well, as it turns out, the Coven was a remnant of the Temple of the Triune. We spoke about them in a past lore video. They were the cult that existed during the Sin War that worshipped the three prime evils. Over time, they were relegated to a shadowy group that awaited signs of the return of the prime evils. Kind of like a 
tinfoil hat doomsday cult. Now, during her time with the coven, Adria met Magda. Yep, I know that name is enough to set some Diablo fans foaming at the mouth for what she did in Diablo 3. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, no spoilers, but remember this name. Magda and Adria became close. And because the coven wasn't doing all that great before Adria and Magda joined, you know, just waiting around for the primevals isn't exactly succeeding at life. Magda convinced Adria to poison the leaders of the coven so that they could take control of it. And that's exactly what they did. I don't think that's the first thing that comes to the mind of a reasonable person, so this pretty well establishes that Adria and Magda are some bad hombres. Or muheres, in this case. The duo then fueled the coven with new, dark ambitions to become heralds of the burning hells. And the coven's power rose over the following years before Adria and Magda had a falling out. Adria felt that Magda had grown too complacent. You know, basically the same thing that Magda accused the previous leadership of being. So Adria left the coven, and Magda uh, did not take things well. Adria's departure almost destroyed the coven. But we'll come back to the coven in a future episode, because this is when Adria comes to Tristram. We're now caught up in the timeline. Now, we mentioned last episode how Deckard Cain was pretty much the only person in town who wasn't freaked out by Adria and would regularly engage in conversations with her. Though that's probably because Cain will talk to anyone who will stay a while and listen. Well, in those conversations, Cain lets slip details about a certain black soul stone. Good job, Cain. Well done. I'm sure giving a witch this information will have no negative repercussions. I guess the poor guy is just used to people ignoring what he says. And in fairness, Adria almost did. She didn't think much of the Black Soulstone at the time. And probably for the rest of this episode. But just wait for Black Soulstone 2, Electric Boogaloo. So at the end of last episode, Aiden had defeated Diablo and plunged his Soulstone into his forehead. Adria could sense Diablo's essence within Aiden. When Aiden spoke, she heard thousands of voices. Diablo whispered to her of the end of days, gave her dreams of decay and corruption, and pronounced her worthy to serve him. This apparently was a massive turn-on for her, because not only did she pledge herself to Diablo's service, she also uh, got pregnant with his baby. But this was part of their plan, to give birth to a child that could serve as Diablo's mortal vessel. That child would end up being a baby girl named Leah, whom we'll meet in Diablo 3. But not just yet. Let's get back to Aiden for a moment. After his victory in the depths of Tristram Cathedral, he was never the same. He started to shun people and stay isolated in the day while wandering the streets aimlessly at night. You know, wandering in the dark. And that's why they called him Prince Aiden. The townsfolk tried to brighten Aiden's mood by holding a celebration in his honor, but instead he slipped away during the festivities. Cain found him that night by himself, wearing clothing that hooded his face. He was muttering and mumbling, I thought I could contain it. I thought I could contain it. Then some nonsense about brothers awaiting him in the east. But Aiden's brother was dead, right? The next day, Aiden disappeared, traveling east. And not long after, Adria also left Tristram, taking Jillian the barmaid with her, of all people. You see, Ogden and Garda had offered to let Jillian and her grandmother stay with them indefinitely, but... Jillian continued to be plagued with nightmares that just wouldn't go away. So she figured, you know, maybe leaving the place that was ground zero for an invasion from hell would do her some good. And Adria promised to find a way to cure her nightmares. So the unlikely duo, the witch and the barmaid, traveled to the city of Chaldeum, which we visit in Diablo 3. And that's where Adria gave birth to Leah. Adria then left baby Leah in Jillian's care, cast a protective spell around Jillian's new home, and left to buy a pack of cigarettes disappearing from her daughter's life forever. Or just about. We'll leave Jillian and Leah now for a future episode, as the little girl has some growing up to do before she becomes relevant to the plot again. Back to Aiden. As he ventured east, this is when he became known as the Dark Wanderer. By now, there was little left of the man. He traveled east, passing through Eastgate Monastery, once a bastion held by the Sisters of the Sightless Eye. But Diablo had sent a vanguard before him. A horde of demons led by Andariel, the Maiden of Anguish. Now, you may remember that Andariel has kind of flip-flopped allegiances before. She first was an ally of Diablo, but then during the Dark Exile, she teamed up with the lesser evils to overthrow the three prime evils. And when the plan worked, she actually taunted Diablo and reveled in his humiliating defeat. However, about 300 years after the Dark Exile of the prime evils to the mortal world, with Diablo rising again, Andariel and her twin brother Duriel kind of saw where things were going and decided to rejoin the winning team. And apparently all was forgiven because 
I mean, how can you stay mad at this face? So Andario led an assault on the Eastgate Monastery because it served as a strategic passage through the mountains into Aranach to the east. Control the monastery and you can block that passage. Currently, the monastery was held by the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye, a group of rogues of whom Morena was a member. She was the rogue from Diablo 1 that we spoke about last episode. She helped Aiden fight the demons in the cathedral, and she had then returned to the Eastgate Monastery. Now, the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye was a group of some of the most skilled archers who were originally a faction that had broken off from the Ascari, aka the Amazons. We teased you about talking about the Amazons twice before, and we'll tease you a third time. Stay tuned for a... Nah, never mind. Let's, let's talk about Amazons. The Ascari are a matriarchal society from the Skobos Isles, a group of four main islands overgrown with dense rainforest. And the Ascari cities are built within the forest canopy. Within Ascari society, only women serve as warriors. Men can hold a variety of positions of responsibility within the community, including clergy, merchants, even political office, though the highest positions of power the two queens, is a no boys allowed club. Political power among the Ascari is shared between two castes, a warrior caste and an oracle caste, each represented by a queen. And this tradition dates back millennia and is tied to the religion of the Ascari. They worship a pantheon of deities that is led by two important figures, Philios and Lycander. Now, hopefully those names are familiar. We spoke about them way back in episode two. What, you mean you don't remember something I said in a video four years ago? To recap, the first generation Nephilim Philios fell in love with the angel Lycander. Philios, on Sanctuary, maintained contact with Lycander in heaven using an artifact called the Sightless Eye. Once her fellow angels realized that Lycander was communicating with someone outside of heaven, which is a, a big no-no, Lycander was forced to end the world's longest distance, long distance relationship and told Philios to hide the Sightless Eye. Philios hid the eye on Scobos and after a period of heartbreak, rebounded with a mortal woman named Ascara. With her, he gave birth to twin girls who would grow up to become leaders in their culture, one forming the Amazon caste and the other the Oracle caste. They had learned of the Sightless Eye. They had found it, discovered that it could be used to see the future. So the Sightless Eye became an integral part of Ascari society. The Oracle caste predicted the dark exile thousands of years before it happened. They predicted that the three primevals would walk the mortal world, so the Amazon cast trained for millennia to be ready for the invasion of hell. However, one day, a group of dissidents within the Ascari society absconded with the Sightless Eye. Because what bigger F.U. can you give the government than by stealing the most precious artifact upon which the entirety of the society is based off of? These dissidents fled Scovos and wound up at the Eastgate Monastery in Conduras. They called themselves the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye, and they began to recruit any woman who sought refuge at the monastery. To the world, they would simply be known as rogues. Around the time of Diablo I, there were a few notable members of the Sisterhood. Two served as leaders, mirroring the same oracle-slash-warrior division of the Ascari. Akara, the High Priestess, was the spiritual leader of the Sisters, while Kashia, a field captain, was the military leader. Akara actually had raised Kashia as a sort of surrogate mother, and Marina, the rogue, was Kashia's closest friend. Another member was Charcy, who was also friends with Marina. When Charcy was a kid, her and her parents were ambushed by Kazra, the goat demons. Charcy's parents managed to hide Charcy away before they were slain. And later, Charcy was found by the Sisterhood, who took her into their care. Charcy was raised into the Sisterhood, and she became a blacksmith for them, wielding an ancient, enchanted smithing hammer crafted long ago by Haradric mages, known as the Haradric Malice. She used it to craft weapons and armor for the Sisterhood. Charcy enjoyed her life with the sisters, but Wanderlust would often strike her. She suspected that her parents were barbarians from the northern steppes, probably because she had the strength of a barbarian, working those powerful arms to beat that smithing hammer. And she wondered what her life would have been like had she been raised as a barbarian. So now we're all set up for Marina's return to the Sisterhood following the events of Diablo 1. Akara, upon her return, felt ill at ease. She sensed that Marina carried something dark within her, and not unlike Aiden, indeed some madness was eating away at her once noble heart. Once Andariel's forces assaulted Eastgate Monastery, Marina sided with Andariel, taking on the name Bloodraven. Many other rogues also became corrupted by Andariel, and the forces of evil managed to take hold of the monastery and drive out the sisterhood. Charcy was forced to leave the Herodric Malice behind in the chaos. The surviving rogues established a temporary encampment in the Bloodmoor until the day they could reclaim the monastery. What? You, you didn't think they actually lived there all that time, did you? 
you didn't you didn't totally skip through every conversation quest dialogue and think that the rogues consisted of like five people in a tiny village, right? Other randoms started to take up residence in the encampment, much to the chagrin of Kashia, who didn't like having to share her home with common plebs like Wariv, Geed, and chickens. They just poop everywhere. The chickens, too. Now, shortly before Andariel's attack on the monastery, a dude named Marius had sought shelter in the monastery. He fled during Andariel's attack to a small tavern in the mountains beyond, where he did everything he could to get the nightmares of the attack out of his mind. But bad luck seemed to follow this poor fellow because Aiden, the Dark Wanderer, crossed through the Eastgate Monastery now held by Andariel and passed through that same tavern. Seemingly unable to contain the evil within him, the Dark Wanderer summoned demons and undead into the tavern and set it ablaze. The only survivor was Marius. And for reasons incomprehensible to a mortal mind, the Wanderer beckoned Marius to follow him. What choice did Marius have? He followed. And from that moment, they traveled together. East. Always. Into the East. And that sets up the story of Diablo 2. But that's a tale for another episode. Oh wait, actually one last detail. After Aiden, Adria, and Jillian left Tristram, uh, demons returned to the village and killed everyone left. Everyone but Deckard Cain, who was put in a cage for some reason. So, what fate would befall the caged Deckard Cain? For what foul purpose was the Dark Wanderer heading east? What crucial role would Marius play in the story? All these questions and more will be answered as we continue to explore this Diablo lore series. Stay tuned. Until then, be sure to get caught up on past episodes. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. As a reminder, we're doing our annual Patreon banner. To get your name on the poster behind me, which you'll be able to buy in the shop, you need to be a Patreon supporter by December 1st, even at the $1 tier. That'll get your name on the poster. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.